I'm Michael Coleman. And I'm Bob Kendrick, president of the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. The cleanest dressing man in Kansas City. <laughs> <laughs> also is. joining us, Steve Jeltz. What's up, homeboy? How you doing, Michael? Doing all right. What we're going to do, this is the Juneteenth oral history of Woody Park in Lawrence. Uh, if some of you aren't hip to this, that they're trying to tear it down to make way for a parking lot. But, you know, we maintain that this park is significant in our community. This ballpark is very important for our kids can still grow. And I don't want to hear or go, I don't want to hear people say, well, baseball's not what it used to be. That's not the point. That's not, that's not the kid's fault. And if you're going to, and jump in here, Bob, if you're going to tear down a ballpark, you're definitely not going to make more interest in it. Yeah, no, and I think for the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, Michael, we have a vested interest in trying to preserve areas that give kids an opportunity to play this game. And while I've never been privy to actually being there at Woody Park, just hearing what I've heard from you and others talk about the significance of what that park has meant historically in terms of opportunities for people like Steve to, to live out his dream. You know, at one point in time, he was a kid yeah. dreaming of playing in the major leagues. And, and, and that dream was fulfilled. And, and we have a vested interest in wanting to see these places be preserved and keep them active and alive. And so we naturally have an interest in this project. Let's bring Steve into the conversation. You played baseball all your life. I mean, I, when I used to see you play ball, you, if you could wear your uniform to class, you would. <laughs> but, you, but your mom and dad are like, no, nah, I'll put some clothes on. But you, you really have a, a, a soft spot for Woody Park, and I want you to tell our viewers why. Well, I grew up uh, on 3rd in Indiana, uh, right uh, two blocks away from Woody Park. And Mr. Woody, he was just a legend before I knew what a legend was. He was always there for all of us. I mean, if you consider the time and then consider the impact he must have had uh, in the community for being a black man at that time and them naming a park after him, it, he had to have a profound effect on all of us, which he did. Um, we played football there. That was our go-to. I remember putting baseballs together with tape and taping up, uh, nailing up and taping up bats, and, and we'd go down there and play baseball. Mr. Woody would be down there, and, and he'd help us out, and he would he would just inspire us to do and, and teach us how to play the game. So, you know, and then we had, of course, Gordon Scott. Um, you were on the Colts or over, over by Riverside, but we played Little League football there, and Gordon Scott. That place was packed all the time. I mean, it's just something, when I heard uh, you talking about getting rid of Woody Park, it's like taking a chunk out of my heart. Um, that's history, and that's, I mean, we, that's where, that was our go-to. We all went there. And it's not about home runs or strikeouts. It's about memories. It's about tradition. It's about exposing youngsters to a ballpark they can just walk to, you know, uh, and not everybody's going to have the best equipment. You talked yourself just now about taping a ball together. That's okay. You did that, and you went to the ballpark, and you played. And if you take that away from the kids, you know, how, how do you, if you're the folks who want to be a part of this, take it away, how is more cars in a parking lot going to be a memory lane for youngsters? And they don't have to go to the pros to have memories, uh, Steve. Absolutely not. I, you know, you know. I'm just sitting here thinking about it and, and reminiscing about the times we had there, and and we were in a time, 1968, the race riots, and and the country was separated. And I think when I got to, we had three junior highs in Lawrence, West, uh, Central, and South, and uh, you know we had one high school, and and some of the seniors when we got to the high school, when I got to the high school, they were the so when some of that was going on earlier, you know, and they kind of grew up with it too. And so it was a little separated, but I think we played together, black, white, Indian. We were all Mexican. We were all at that park playing, and Mr. Woody was there, and it was just we all came together. So by the time we got to high school, we, we all came together. Yeah. We all I, I still remember my friends, Dr. Godwin, Andy Godwin, uh, um, the Wyatt family, the Smith family, you know, Southers, Gaines. I mean, I can name off all the names. 
and, and still know these guys, I mean, talk to these guys from time to time. And, you know, I went on to play Major League Baseball, but that's where it started. And, and Mr. Woody, they honored him in a time when did not very many of us were being honored. So I think, you know, for him to stand out to the, in that magnitude at that time was uh, says a lot. I don't know why they would want to get rid of that. Bob, I know we know Major League Baseball had an issue with, with diversity. Yeah. Thank God for Jackie Robinson. But when it comes to kids, you don't even have to throw that word diversity out there because they're all shapes, all kinds of shapes, sizes, different colors or different ethnic backgrounds or whatever. They all came together for the love of the sport in a local ballpark. Yeah. Well, that's the beauty of ballparks. And that's the beauty of back when I played Sandlot baseball. You know, and it, it saddens me, Michael, that we're losing the tradition of Sandlot baseball. And as Steve is well aware, our sport now has essentially grown from a blue collar sport to an almost country club sport because it's almost pay to play. That's not baseball. That's not how we all got exposed right. to the game. And a neighborhood park like Woody Park brings a lot of memories for a lot of people here in Kansas City, Parade Park, right behind the museum. And it took, we had to really think long and hard about taking away Parade Park, even when we put in a baseball venue with the Urban Youth Academy mm -hmm. because of the rich history yeah. that was part of Parade Park. So many kids grew up playing baseball there. So many got to watch great talent like Frank White and others who came out of this community play there. Yeah. And then we had to make the conscientious decision that we would build this Urban Youth Baseball Academy, which is a magnificent facility that is helping bridge that economic divide that has priced out a lot of kids from playing this game. No sport holds to its history. No sport creates memories quite like baseball. No. And, and, and that's what we're talking about here when you have these kinds of monumental places that were a fabric of a community for so long. You hate to see them lost. And, and I'm guessing here, guys and folks out there, if you really want to help save Woody Park, you're going to have to step up your game and let folks know we're not going to let you do this without a fight. And we can only fight for so long, but that park, I think, deserves uh, that kind of rallying around to, to help keep it in existence. Jelks, when you think about that ballpark and you're a little boy, those fundamentals that you used with Philadelphia and Kansas City, where'd you learn them from? What, what, what ballpark did you learn that from? Woody Park. Right there at Woody Park. That's the only place we had. We went to Woody Park and we played ball there. And I, you know, what Bob just touched on, you know, to change that could only be a change that would move things in the direction that Bob Kendrick was just talking about with their park. You know, there's got to be a plaque up there saying what it used to be and this is where this, what this was. And if you're going to do anything with it, then you magnify it. You don't take it away and make don't a park. Take it away. Don't take it away. Yeah, you, you make it better. Yeah, you, you make it better and you improve upon it. And that's what we were able to do here from a purely baseball perspective. But you know, Michael, even as we were building this beautiful Urban Youth Baseball Academy, it was important that we kept aspects of what was there in the, para, in the, in the in parade park. So we needed to make sure that there was a basketball court. We needed to make right. sure that there was still a playground and, and the tennis courts, although they moved the tennis courts mm -hmm. to another location, th that those things didn't upset the community by our desire to create a baseball specific facility. It was important that the community still feel like they had ownership in this effort. And, and so even as we were improving upon something in the park, yeah. it was still with the community in mind. And, and I think that needs to be the case here. Now, I don't know what a parking lot is going to do. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't. You know, I think Mike, Mike also touched on a very important point, and that's why we started Primal Sports and Primal Sports Charities, because of that financial divide. Yeah. And it's not fair, and they price they price most of these kids out. I mean, I always said if my dad had to pay, you know, a thousand dollars for me to play baseball, never I would have play. never played. Never would have played. And, and and we had people like you know like Mr. Woody at Woody Park, and then all the parents. I mean, people used to just come out. They like to see people would sit and just watch us play. They, I mean, you know, people would be coming home from work and they pull up 
just watch us play, and they come out and play with us, and it's just we had a good time with that. I think it's something that that is lost, and I think we need to gain that back, and we need to separate the the divide financially. So with Primal Sports, what we do is we are going to hand out scholarships to those who can't afford it so we level the playing ground here and and everybody has the opportunity to play working with central penn university uh, uh, college out here as a matter of fact i meet with them on friday because they want to build a facility and then the rbi league um the central penn coach uh, african-american brother that's uh bobby um <coughs> and, he, and he he started he got with the RBI program in Harrisburg, so he's working with the the youth in the, in the inner city, and we're all coming together trying to make something happen. So I mean, I think you know it'd be fantastic for people to start thinking along those lines for Woody Park, like Bob said. Bob be the person. Janine, Mike, there he is. Bob knows how to put that one together. He just <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, That's and the way well, it needs to go. and what needs to be understood, Woody Park is more than just a ballpark. Mr. Yeah. Woody was heavily involved in the community. Yeah. This, I mean, so it wasn't just, it was like, it, it wasn't something new for him. It was something that was a part of his life, yeah. being a part of the youth and their development. Yeah. And we, we've heard the old saying about village to raise the child or whatever the case is. He did it on his own, the best way he could. And to wipe out that memory of what this man meant, and again, it's more than just a ballpark, I think is a travesty. And so whoever it is, if you're listening, you need to think twice about redoing and making a parking lot. Because what happens if you need another parking lot? Yeah. Where, 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 are you going, where are you going to go from there? You know, you, you can't tear down monuments. Well, and the thing about it, Mike, is that someone thought highly enough of Mr. Woody and everything that he gave <laughs> so selflessly of himself that they would name a park there you go for him that's my point and to destroy that and to take that away basically says that i don't really respect what this man had done that so many others had indeed embraced right. and respected to the point that they wanted to name it right. for him and that right. just doesn't seem right well and i think part of the problem is you get new people who move to town, of course. who don't know the history of the town, don't know the history of the park, don't know the significance of the park. They're just making decisions to, to get over. And, well, it's a ballpark. Who cares? Well, dude, you're not from around here. You know, so you need to you talk. Know, Will Chamberlain was Will Chamberlain was at Woody Park. Will Chamberlain, it might have been before they called it Woody Park. But, I mean, we had JoJo White. I, the guys used to come down there. I mean, they were all down there. My dad to my grandpa tell me stories. Out, you know, everybody coming out there just having we picnic there, we played football there, we did everything. Woody Park was phenomenal. I, I mean, that was just and right around the corner, you well, I lived down around there, so it's across the railroad tracks, you're at the river. And I mean, it was just a safe haven. You could go back there and go hunting down across that way, and then you come back up to Woody, and VFW was there. And I mean, I remember that neighborhood well. It's a circle. We used to drive Indiana, third in Indiana, around to Woody Park, but the hospital was right there. So, and the, you know, the Austin family lived right there. Right I mean, that's where we spent our time. Woody Park was my history. That's where I started. That's my roots. Absolutely. My brother's roots and all the other names that I told you. That there are so many people that have been there, and it was just a spot. And Woody Park has history. And I can name three families who, who lived by that park whose homes are no longer there. And I'm not saying that they, that they uh, fought against it being torn down, but... The Austins, who you just mentioned, the uh, the Rileys, and I think and Alan Wright, they lived yeah, that way, right, right? And we were like, like within walking distance on Third and Arkansas. Those four homes are gone. They're now parking lots. So yeah. what? So how much more do you want? You got you you tore down four homes where families were, you know, and no one objected. But I think folks need to object to this development right here. So. Uh, again, yeah, I think what they can start doing is it's, it, it's nice that they have a focus on that spot. So let's make it better. All right. So uh, anything you want to add, Bob? Because we're gonna wrap it up right here. But uh, this needs to be talked about and talked about heavily. Well, I, I do hope that the community rallies around a park that has so much history. And uh, and again, like I said, the Negro Leagues Museum has a vested interest in these places, particularly these places that created opportunities for African-American kids yeah. 
to play this game. And, you know, as we're now looking at places where the last remnants of Negro League stadiums that are still in existence, up in Patterson, New Jersey, they're re renovating, they're restoring Hinchcliffe Stadium. Yes, and, they are. And, uh -huh, and I was there when they designated it as a National Her Historic mm -hmm. Landmark so that it could not be turned into anything else. And now it is about to be open as an active ballpark, again, multi-purpose. Sure. So they made it, they improved upon it, not only created a baseball field, but also created other opportunities for multi-sport kind of complex and shops and restaurants. And the same thing is happening in Detroit at Hamtramck Stadium. And that stadium is being preserved and restored. Same what thing. About, what about Municipal Stadium here in Kansas City? Well, we see, and that's what happened. We tore Municipal down after they built the stadium complex, which is now Kauffman Stadium and Arrowhead Stadium. But what did we do? We at least created a monument there on the corner of 22nd and Brooklyn that designates it as the place that the Kansas City Monarchs once called home, but so did the Kansas City Blues, the Kansas City Chiefs, Kansas City Royals, A's. Kansas City A's all played there. And so at least some remnant of that history is there, you know, but the stadium was torn down and lost. And of course it moved out to the, the, the current yeah. complex. And that was also one of the issues that hurt people in the urban core because you didn't have the mode of transportation to get out to Kauffman Stadium. And, and all of a sudden you started to develop this gap in the love affair between black folks and Major League Baseball. Right. And you saw this not only in Kansas City, but in other major league cities across the country, the stadiums left the downtown environment and then moved to the suburbs, and we didn't have access to transportation. And there wasn't the kind of readily available rapid transportation, and it still isn't in Kansas City. If you don't have a car, it's hard to get yes. to the K yes. to this day. You know, and yes. so it yes. helped create a little bit of divide. So you do need these community-minded assets that are available to, again, we want kids to fall in love with this game yeah. and, and to be able to, to get out and participate in athletic competition, no matter whether it's baseball or not. And, and so, you know, you want to save those opportunities for young people so that they create their own memories as well that are going to be etched around, more times than not, community-minded initiatives. I think also it hurts baseball since we're talking about the disparity of young kids really latching on to it. They play these postseason games at eight and nine o'clock at night on a school yeah. night, yeah. you know, and so they're not going to be allowed to step and watch the game. I mean, I've heard stories where back in the day, kids were allowed to take their transistor radio to school to, school <laughs> to listen to the day games, yeah. but you can't do I that today. My first game professional baseball game, the Kansas City Royals from Laverne Funeral Home balcony <laughs> because my uncle, Uncle Laverne, had that and I just used to sit there on that balcony. He had one of those bikes that you sit on and you could pedal and he, the handlebar move and I used to go up on that balcony and, and remember see, seeing a, a Major League Bay watching the Kansas City Royals when they played across the street. And, you know, it's funny, I, I went to a Boston Red Sox game. Um, I flew out with my agent uh, from Philadelphia, and I sat in the stands, and it was the first time that I have, had ever sat at a major league stadium in the stands in my life. And I had already, been, I was playing with the Phillies. It was 88, 89. And we, I can't remember when, when the Angels played Boston. The whole time I sat in the stands as a fan at a major league baseball game. Well, so that divide you're talking about and being way it's out there Absolutely. is it's real. Yes. yes. And, and and Frank White, we mentioned Frank White. Yeah, Frank was the, the best ball player, player, not in the Baseball Hall of Fame. Certainly. All right. Should be in the Hall of Fame. The exposure he got was working on the stadium. Yeah. I mean, this guy helped build Kaufman Stadium and wind <laughs> up hitting home runs and stealing bases in it. I mean, you can't get any better access than that. But no, the exposure I, you know, I to I the sport. Frank I tease Frank, we had a joke in the clubhouse because, you know, my brother was, went walked on up at KU and they said he wasn't good enough. And then he, two weeks later, he was in the Royals Academy with Frank. 
<laughs> so him and Frank were, were were working together out there, and then he threw his arm out because he was seven years older than me. So I teased Frank about that. I told him when I was a freshman at KU, we went down and played the exhibition game against the Royals. Whitey Herzog was man, and that was when George and Frank and I don't know who really? you, uh, yeah, and all of them were out there at that time. Um, Big John Mayberry, yes. and and so then in '90 I cut roll all the way back around, and now I signed with the Kansas City Royals. And and Frank's still playing. And when I told him that, he said, "Jelsey, shut up." <laughs> I said, "I was watching you when I was a little kid, Frank. Now I'm playing with you." I said, "You know what? He can play baseball." And, and I tell you, he's a class act. I, and, you know, Frank White is is a good man. And mm. and I just, I it made me, it made my stay in Kansas City. We have a question. We got this live audience. Ain't a whole bunch of people, but we got folks who are interested. I can tell they're like, okay, this turned out a whole lot better than we thought it was going to. Your question, Janine. Uh, it's for Mr. Kendrick. Yes. The first game, and I noticed it in your museum, was March 23rd of 1930, played in North Kansas, a nighttime First game. night game, yes. Was that at Wendy's Park? I almost have to believe it was. We've been trying to find I exactly where this game took place but my my guess is that it almost had to be woody park but i don't know i don't know that for certain so if anybody out there we've been trying to find the kansas city monarchs debuted night baseball in 1930 five years before they ever played a night game in the major leagues and they did test the lights in lawrence kansas and, and so we have been for the longest trying to figure <laughs> out what field did they test these lights on. So if anybody knows there, y'all hit old Bob up and let me know, uh, or else we just gonna stick to our story. <laughs> works for me. Uh, just, it works for me. Anybody else? Anybody else? Hey, thank you all for joining us. A lot of this you're gonna be able to see on Juneteenth, which is June 17th this year. Uh, it's, it's, it banged last year. It's going to be even stronger this year. Hopefully, Bob, if he's in town, Bob's a busy guy. He's ubiquitous. That means he's everywhere. But hopefully he can come down and join. And Jeltz, you know, you don't need an invitation to come back home. Mark your calendar, my man. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. For, uh, good to see you guys again. Good seeing Bob, you, man. Same here, Steve, man. Always great to see you. For Steve Jeltz, Bob Kendrick, I'm Michael Coleman. We'll see you on Juneteenth. And please respond regarding the history of Woody Park. Thank you for watching.